Welcome to the UIS Center for Lincoln Studies. 
My name is Ann Mosley. I am the acting director for the Center for Lincoln Studies, where we try to discover more about the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln and the people that he surrounded himself with. And one of those key individuals was Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln's biggest rival, but also one of America's biggest visionaries uh, who came from the East out to the Midwest to discover more about the United States and to achieve his dream of political greatness. The Center for Lincoln Studies hosts uh, a number of programs that invite us to look at the past through different lenses, uh, to study Lincoln in different ways uh, that allow us to connect with him uh, through his character, through the way that he created public policy, uh, how he interacted with others, to see how we can become more civically minded individuals uh, in our daily lives. And in the midst of civic season, Lincoln is a great person to call upon. But also, it's important to look at other political uh, visionaries around his time, just as Mr. Douglas. Here in the center, we're very fortunate to have not only a Lincoln scholar, but also a Stephen Douglas historian within our ranks. Um, who have studied the life of Lincoln's rival and his interactions uh, with individuals here in the state of Illinois and in the nation abroad. The program tonight seeks to highlight two scholars who have done in-depth research on the life of Stephen Douglas and his effect on the Lincoln legacy, but also the American legacy overall. Tonight, we will be looking at Reg Ingram's work on Stephen Douglas. He has written two wonderful books uh, discovering the rich resources out there, both with the Library of Congress, but also here in the Midwest about the life of Stephen Douglas, a person who has been under scrutiny recently, but has had a legacy of his own one that hasn't been fully understood and one that needs to look, be looked at with a little bit more clarity. So tonight, I'm gonna to introduce our moderator, who Peck, who is on staff here at the University of Illinois at Springfield. Professor Peck is the Wepner Distinguished Professor of Lincoln Studies here at UIS. He is the author of Making an Anti-Slavery Nation, Lincoln, Douglas, and the Battle Over Freedom. And he wrote, directed, and produced a feature-length film on Douglas, Stephen A. Douglas, and the fate of American democracy. In 2020, he co-directed a second film, Lincoln and Douglas, Touring Illinois in Turbul Turbulent Times, a 47-minute road film about the Lincoln-Douglas debates that will premiere in October at the Lincoln Legacy Lectures which we will have you stay tuned for, for more information, because there are some exciting news coming from the Center for Lincoln Studies on this year's special Lincoln Legacy Lecture. So I'm gonna bring in Grant, uh, Dr. Peck. Good evening. Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful. It's finally sunny here. We've gotten uh, rid of some of the rain. So luckily we've had a nice night for our discussion tonight. And I'm looking forward to hear uh, what you and uh, Mr. Ingram have to say about Stephen Douglas and some of the surprising, uh, interesting history that we can discover um, by looking at not only his life, but uh, also his connection to Lincoln. Um, so are you ready to bring on uh, Mr. Ingram? We are indeed. Uh, so it's a pleasure. Thank you, first of all, for having us both here uh, tonight, Anne. And it's a pleasure to introduce Reg Ankrum, who I've known probably for about 12 to 13 years. We were both members of the Stephen A. Douglas Association, which is now defunct, but was in existence for about 50 years. And um, we would gather annually at the tomb uh, uh, to um, remember uh, his legacy uh, on the anniversary of his death each summer. And so I'm very interested to uh, read Reg's uh, second book, Stephen A. Douglas, Western Man, The Early Years in Congress, 1844 to 1850, and to hear what Reg has to, uh, to tell us tonight. Uh, Reg was born in Jacksonville, 
uh, Illinois, which was a community named for Andrew Jackson, and Douglas uh, chose to live there early on in his tenure in Illinois, starting in 1833. And, uh, and Reg later worked in Springfield, as did uh, Douglas, and he now resides and has for some time in Quincy, uh, Illinois, the Mississippi River town, uh, whose voters in 1843 first uh, help elect Douglas to Congress. So uh, Reg is frequently giving talks about Douglas and about antebellum Illinois politics throughout the state. Uh, he's written more than 100 columns and articles and essays, and, uh, and, and we are glad to invite him to, uh, to talk to us tonight. So Reg, welcome. Thank you, Graham. It's good to be with you. And my thanks too to uh, Ann Mosley and the uh, Center for Lincoln Studies at UIS for allowing us to be together. So our plan tonight is Reg is going to speak, uh, give us a talk for about 30 minutes or so, and then uh, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation and some Q&A with the audience. So Great. Reg, take it away. Thank you, Graham. And thanks to all of you for uh, being with us tonight as well. I'm going to start by letting you know that on a Saturday in late September last year, a crew of laborers removed an eight-foot bronze statue of 19th century Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas from a granite base on the east lawn of the state capitol in Springfield. The architect of the capitol took the action at the request of House Speaker Michael Madigan, who said in a statement that he had been disturbed by what he had read in historian Sidney Blumenthal's Lincoln biography, All the Powers of the Earth. Quote, I learned, Madigan wrote, quote, of Stephen Douglas's disturbing past as a Mississippi slave owner and his abhorrent words toward people of color, end quote. The House Speaker said he had had his staff research Blumenthal's claim to confirm its history and to support removing statues from the rotunda inside and the lawn outside of the Capitol and to cover a large Douglas portrait in the House chamber. They were, Speaker Madigan said, symbols of hate. Madigan's powerful words washed across the state. A few days later, the University of Chicago removed two displays honoring Douglas, who was the first president of the university's board of trustees. Three state representatives asked not long ago that a nine foot statue be removed from the top of a tomb in which Douglas's body is buried or interned on Chicago's Southwest side. A Chicago Sun-Times editorial supported the initiative saying that quote, Douglas's tolerance for slavery has long been known, but the fact that he actually owned slaves in another state was not widely known before the publication of Blumenthal's book last year. There's a not so surprising reason for that. It's not true. Douglas never owned plantation or slave. Blumenthal writes that Robert Martin, father of Douglas's first wife, Martha Denny Martin, gave Douglas on the day after their marriage a 2,500 acre plantation and 100 slaves in Mississippi. But Colonel Martin himself wrote that Douglas declined the gift. In his will, Martin reminded Martha that Douglas told him it was not the kind of property a Northern man cared to own. Martin left the Mississippi plantation, its slaves, and sole authority for their administration to Douglas's wife. When he died in 1848, Martin left the Mississippi plantation, slaves, exclusive control to his daughter, stipulating that it go to her children or assigns on her death. Mississippi law at the time prohibited Douglas from any claim of ownership or control in his wife's plantation or slaves. In Mississippi, the law made all property of a married woman no matter how she acquired it, hers exclusively. When she died on January 18, 1853, sons Robert III and Stephen Arnold Jr. II became sole heirs to the Mississippi slave properties. As the boy's surviving parent, Douglas under Mississippi law was now permitted to manage the property for which he could derive up to 30% of the net income. To his discredit, he did. I wanted to begin my talk tonight with this story because it demonstrates the extent to which permitted, to which mistakes can be memorialized, acted upon, and history changed as a result. 20-year-old Stephen Arnold Douglas put himself at the vanguard of the nation's early 19th century migration west. His ambition was the law, and he had studied three of the seven years New York required of its practitioners. But when he learned that Ohio required only one year, he impulsively decided to go west, his mother Sarah fearing the worst for her son. He had been sickly throughout his childhood. She pleaded with him not to go. 
but she could not alter his determination. When would he return, she asked. Quote, I'll stop by and see you on my way to Congress within 10 years, he answered. He served his political apprenticeship over the next 10 years in central and western Illinois. His advances were stunning. Told by Supreme Court Justice Samuel Drake Lockwood he needed to study more law, Douglas, at 22 years old, not only became a lawyer, he became state's attorney of the 8th Judicial District, the largest in Illinois, under a bill he wrote and the legislature passed that changed the way state's attorneys were appointed. In doing so, he ejected from office John J. Hardin, the nephew of Kentucky's U.S. Senator Henry Clay, whose so-called corrupt bargain with John Quincy Adams in 1824 had denied Douglas's hero, Andrew Jackson, the presidency. It was for Douglas sweet revenge. The Whig, Abraham Lincoln, did not think much of Douglas when he first saw him in Vandalia lobbying Democrats for his bill. A full foot taller than the five foot four inch Douglas, Lincoln would nudge his seatmate and say, that's the least man I ever saw. During the decade of Douglas's apprenticeship, Lincoln would not disparage him again. In 1835, Douglas and Jacksonville newspaper editor S.S. Brooks created Illinois' Democratic Party, and Douglas got himself elected to its most powerful post. The position that year propelled him and other Democrats to win six of Morgan County's eight seats in the General Assembly. To disconnect himself from the legislature's nearly bankrupting internal improvement spending he did not seek re-election, but he bounced back favorably. President Martin Van Buren in 1837 appointed him registrar of the more lucrative federal land office in Springfield. In 1840, Douglas began maneuvering himself toward election to Congress. He influenced Governor Thomas Carlin to appoint him Secretary of State. Carlin actually had someone else in mind, but Douglas had the wires pulled. He served in that office for only three months, but it was long enough to push for, then sign, the charter that turned a small Mississippi River town into the city of Nauvoo. It was the new Zion for more than 6,000 Mormons, and Douglas could count votes. The grateful Mormon prophet Joseph Smith, who could influence his followers there, called Douglas a master spirit in the church and that the church would not forget him. Douglas also won the affections of two other large voting blocks in Illinois, the Irish and Germans, whose votes Whigs attempted to suppress in 1839. In the state Supreme Court, Douglas argued for the franchise of unnaturalized Illinoisans and won the so-called alien case, and he would win the alien vote. In his most outlandish effort of political engineering, Douglas wrote a bill that became law in 1841 to pack the Illinois Supreme Court. The Douglas bill, as it was called, increased the number of justices from four to nine, and legislators appointed Democrats, including the 27-year-old Douglas, to all five new seats. Douglas then engineered his appointment to the 5th Judicial District, headquartered in Quincy, which had large populations of German and Irish residents, and which was just 40 miles south of all those Mormon votes at Nauvoo. Serving as circuit judge also, it was Douglas who fined Quincy physician Richard Eels $400 for violating an Illinois law that prohibited harboring fugitive slaves. It remains a notable case as the only Underground Railroad conviction that was appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which upheld Douglas's ruling. In early 1843, Democrats of Illinois nominated their candidates for Congress, and Douglas was nominated in the 5th Congressional District. He resigned from the court in June and began his campaign against Quincy Whig, Orville Hickman Browning. It was an exhausting campaign. The two spent the last 40 days before the August 30 election, Sundays excluded at Browning's insistence, traveling, dining, debating, often sleeping together. Douglas exposed his expansionist character, reminding audiences that only Arkansas and Missouri had been organized west of the Mississippi. He promised that he would build an ocean-bound republic and eliminate red lines on the map if elected. Those red lines showed where Britain, France, and Spain had interests that Douglas believed threatened the United States. Voters liked his ideas and elected him over Browning. In November 1843, he stopped in Clifton Springs, New York to visit his mother, Sarah. That was the promise he made to her 10 years earlier, a promise kept. 
To get to Washington, D.C., Congressman-elect Douglas traveled through a free state and a slave state, Pennsylvania the free and Maryland the slave. If he thought about that, he did not say. But he would soon find that his goal of expanding the nation required aligning interests of the North, the South, and now the Western sections, which would require the most artful of political skills. Typical for Douglas, he was in his seat well before the 28th Congress was scheduled to convene at noon that Monday, December 4th, 1843. Yet he found all hell was breaking loose already. The chaos was over whether to seat 22 men from four states that had violated a federal law, a rare Whig majority in the Congress had passed, and the Whig president had signed in 1842. The law required congressmen to be elected in districts rather than statewide, a condition that tended to elect Democrats. Abraham Lincoln recognized the problem when in 1840, he declined a request by five Whig friends in Illinois to run for governor. Quote, a Whig will never win statewide office in Illinois, Lincoln explained. The bedlam in the U.S. House, now approaching a constitutional crisis, continued for the next four days. In a lull at the end of the first day, Democrat John Winston Jones of Virginia was elected speaker. While the turmoil continued, he assigned Douglas, the youngest congressman who also had been Illinois' youngest Supreme Court justice, to find a constitutional resolution. Within just a few weeks, Douglas did so. He acknowledged that 22 states, including his own Illinois, had already adopted a district system for congressional elections, but he pointed out they did so by their own volition, not by an act of Congress. This was an important insight into Douglas's thinking and, keys, and the key to his resolution. He had looked to the debates in the Constitutional Convention of 1787, which he said showed that its delegates meant that the power of Congress over elections should be exercised only in the event the states themselves refused to legislate on the subject. Nowhere, Douglas wrote, did the Constitution give the Congress authority to tell voters of any state how to elect their own representatives. Most of his colleagues agreed, and all 22 congressmen were seated. The resolution was important to understanding and predicting Douglas. It demonstrated that the Constitution, in its allocation of powers to states and federal government, was the bedrock for Douglas's principles. While Mr. Lincoln could say, quote, I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration, end quote, this, Douglas's first contribution to the nation, showed that the Constitution and law would be the wellspring for policies reflecting his political thought. This would be clear in his approach to the major issue of Texas, an independent republic since its, republic, since its revolution against Mexico in 1835-36. Eight years later, Texas was still burdened with significant debt and still seeking annexation into the United States, which it hoped would pay for the debt. Slavery was legal in the Texas Republic, a key reason Northern Whigs objected to its annexation. But Secretary of State John C. Calhoun warned that the British sought to acquire Texas to abolitionize it. If Great Britain did that and ridded Texas of slavery, Calhoun warned further, American labor costs would rise, risking higher prices and loss of markets for American goods. Since Texas was a foreign nation, a treaty was required to annex it, and treaties took a two-thirds vote of the Senate to concur in them. Calhoun drafted the treaty, then killed any chance of the Senate's concurrence in it when he let slip that the South wanted Texas only for slavery. In the House, first-termer Douglas devised an ingenious plan to bring Texas in by joint resolution, which would take a simple majority vote in the two chambers of Congress. It was the first time anyone had tried it, but Douglas's knowledge of history just might make it work. In a preamble to his measure, Douglas charged that the United States had acted illegally in handing Texas to Spain in a trade for Florida in 1819. He demonstrated that when France sold its Louisiana territory to the United States in 1803, it stipulated that part of Texas in the territory was to be admitted to the Union as soon as possible and its people become citizens of the United States. Douglas said the United States therefore had no right to sell to Spain, Texas, and convey American citizens who emigrated there to it. 
Texas citizens wanted the U.S. to fulfill its obligation to annex it. Douglas said the United States was obligated to do so. Quote, we have no right to set up our own wrong as an excuse for refusing to do justice to Texas, he said. Quote, a breach of faith on our part does not absolve us from the legal obligation to fulfill our solemn treaty stipulations when required by the other party. We have no right to claim Texas, but Texas has a right to claim and to demand admission into the Union in pursuance of the Treaty of 1803. Douglas's argument was that the Senate had already approved the Treaty of 1803, whose provisions were now to be honored by this subsequent policy, which then took only a joint resolution. Douglas's proposal received widespread support. His resolution was stalled, however, by a provision that Texas be admitted into the Union, quote, with or without slavery as the people at the time of application desired, end quote. More interested in success than credit, he removed the troubling language, his first attempt in 1845 to inject popular sovereignty into a territorial, territorial admission, and induced his friend Milton Brown, a Tennessee Whig, to carry the bill, which then passed the House and then the Senate. Douglas's strategy made Texas the 28th state in December of 1845. Under international law, slavery, which had been legal in Texas, now remained legal in, the te in Texas the state. It had been admitted, Douglas made clear, however, quote, without reference to slavery and without hostility or protection of the institution, end quote. Recognizing the strengths of Douglas's work, Speaker John W. Davis of Indiana in the 29th Congress appointed him chairman of the House Committee on the Territories at the beginning of his second term. The issue of Texas had put Douglas squarely into the vortex of the nation's greatest and longest dilemma. Speaker Davis had put Douglas in a powerful position to do something about it. How Douglas would respond in the House and in the Senate, where he held the same post a few years later, would be revealed as he began to organize the West. <clears throat> Congressman Douglas was greatly disappointed with his president, James Polk, a Democrat from Tennessee, and the South when they abrogated their promise to support the organization of Oregon. Texas and Oregon had been the springboards of, du of Polk's election in 1844, and the South had assured support for Oregon's admission if Texas was admitted. Now, Douglas saw both Polk and the South backing away from these promises. Polk's Secretary of State, James Buchanan, had convinced the president that Oregon would cause a war with Britain, and Southerners used that as an excuse against a new Northwestern state, hardly mentioning, of course, that it would likely be a free state with two new U.S. senators. Once again, opponents feared war with Britain, which jointly occupied Oregon with the United States under the Treaty of Ghent that followed the War of 1812. Douglas provided a differing view. He pointed out that the Monroe Doctrine, which John Quincy Adams, as Monroe's Secretary of State, had written, declared that the American continents are henceforth not to be considered subjects for future colonization by any European power. Illinois' delegation supported their colleague on the floor of the House, but the matter fell silent when Britain began to fortify Canadian garrisons. The intransigence over Oregon and an insensitive President Polk almost drove Douglas from Congress. He had been spilling his complaints about the president, ignoring him in animated correspondence to his old opponent, and more recent friend, John Hardin of Jacksonville, after he, after he left Congress in 1845. Hardin, a popular Whig in Illinois, and an experienced and courageous military officer, suggested that if war developed with Great Britain over Oregon, that they form a land expedition and seize Oregon. Hardin proposed a similar action to seize California if war developed with Mexico. Hardin wanted Douglas to join him, and Douglas wrote back that he was, quote, much gratified with your views in regard to the plan of the expeditions, end quote. On May 14th, the Quincy Whig reported that a force of me Mexican soldiers had crossed to the east side of the Rio Grande River and killed two U.S. officers and 26 U.S. soldiers. President Polk sent a firm message to Congress, quote, war exists, end quote. Douglas and all his Illinois colleagues, including the lone Whig, Edward Baker, stood with the president. So did all but 16 of the 230 representatives and senators in Congress, 
among the opponents was former president and now Massachusetts Congressman John Quincy Adams. Adams insisted the slain federal troops were on Mexican soil. Historian Douglas rose to say that, quote, ancient authorities, end quote, and here he was talking about the aged Adams himself, proved otherwise. As President Monroe's Secretary of State, it was Adams, Douglas affirmed, who established the Rio Grande, then called the Rio Norte, as the western boundary of Texas. Adams denied Douglas's history. Douglas then produced the document, the adams onus Treaty, in which Adams, by train of fact and argument, Prove the Rio Grande was the western border. Trapped, Adams squirmed. John Forney, who would become the first secretary of the Senate, wrote, quote, this was a bombshell. It was a new thing to see John Quincy Adams retreating before anybody. The House divided between admiration for this new actor on the great stage of national affairs and reverence for the retiring chief. With the Mexican War underway, Hardin raised one of two Illinois regiments and asked Douglas to join him as his aide-de-camp. Still ignored by his president, Douglas agreed. It was only after Douglas had asked each of his colleagues in Illinois' congressional delegation to write to President Polk to award him a military commission did Polk finally respond. He called Douglas to the White House one evening, listened to his grievances, asked him withdraw, to withdraw his request for a military commission, and told him he could best serve his country in Congress. If he would support the administration, Polk told Douglas, quote, he could, if he would, lead the Democratic Party for him in the House, end quote. Although he said, if, he said he felt a strong desire to go with the troops Hardin had recruited, Douglas abandoned the idea of leaving Congress. The decision would serve the country in the years ahead. Hardin himself was killed in the war at the Battle of Buena Vista, on February 23rd, 1847, with hundreds of his soldiers. It was another event, this one in 1846, that created the earthquake in Congress and the country. Democratic Congressman David Wilmot, a Pennsylvania labor lawyer, introduced an amendment to a bill to fund negotiations for peace. Wilmot's proviso called for a ban on slavery from any territory acquired from Mexico in reparation for the war. Polk was aghast and said it would only heat sectional feelings. But Wilmot's proviso was not about slavery. It sought a federal policy, racist in nature, to protect Wilmot's constituency, white laboring men. Wilmot would prohibit slavery, not because of an aversion to it, but because of an aversion to blacks. Quote, where the Negro slave laborers Wilmot said, the free white man cannot labor by his side without sharing in his degradation and disgrace, end quote. Although he did not elaborate, Douglas believed the Wilmot controversy was a strategy to divide the Democratic Party by causing discord between Northern and Southern Democrats. The Illinois delegation's first Wilmot supporter, Democratic Congressman John Wentworth of Chicago, came to agree with Douglas. Another Illinois congressman, Abraham Lincoln, on the other hand, would say he voted some 40 times for Wilmot. Douglas and Wentworth simply refused to discuss the proviso any further. A session by Mexico to the United States of more than 500,000 square miles of land accompanied the end of the Mexican War. The political sections of the country more divided than ever. In his role as chairman of the Senate Committee on the Territories, Douglas made several attempts to settle the status of land acquired from Mexico. The level of tensions over slavery meant it had to be considered. Douglas proposed again the extension of the Missouri Compromise Line. When that failed, he proposed that the courts decide matters of free or slave states. He proposed California and New Mexico, which had sufficient populations, skip the territorial process and be admitted directly as states. They could decide for themselves whether congressional, without congressional intervention, the matter of slavery. Each of his proposals was rebuffed. Then he proposed bringing in the entire half million acre session as the state of California. He believed bringing in the entire landmass would overcome the difficulty that had hampered every other proposal that difficulty being slavery. Douglas was now ready to admit that slavery stood in the way of national expansion and, become a, and had become a test for every issue that came before the Congress. 
With nothing, with nothing accomplished, the 29th Congress ended. Douglas was disappointed. Only his bill to organize Minnesota had become law. Oregon remained unorganized, so too California. And his fourth attempt to organize Nebraska once again died for lack of action. President James Knox Polk returned to, Penn, to Nashville, where he died within three months. Mexican war hero Zachary Taylor was inaugurated president on March 4, 1849. He had been born and raised on plantations in Virginia. Southern Whigs were hopeful. Southern Democrats, however, were suspicious. Taylor surprised all sides when he recommended that Californians create their own constitution, and they did so. And in Article 1, Section 18, they prohibited slavery in their constitution and involuntary solitude. In November 13, on November 13, 1849, Californians approved the constitution 12,678 to 811 and elected their first representatives to Congress. Those representatives elected John C. Fremont and W.H. Gwynn, a slaveholder, to the U.S. Senate. California had proven Douglas Wright. He had predicted that if people were left to determine the matter for themselves, they would not vote for slavery. He wrote to Charles Lanfear, Springfield Register's editor, quote, the Free Soilers declared that slavery would go there in California unless Congress prohibited it. The result has shown we were right and they were wrong, end quote. As the 31st Congress convened, numerous bills were related to the Numerous bills were introduced related to the Mexican session again. Douglas opposed attempts by Senators Henry Clay and Foote to refer them to the Judiciary Committee and influence their referrals to his committee on the territories where he could control them. He was happy, however, to yield to Clay, who wanted to sponsor the bills in the Senate. Four had been written by Douglas. Clay introduced them over his over Clay introduced them over two days, calling him his plan of peace. His final comments were on, quote, the glorious fruits of union and his fear of separation. He pleaded for calm, north and south, and for comedy. Finally, he finished. He did not know it at the time, but so were his resolutions. Against his better judgment, Clay accepted Foote's recommendation to bind the measures together in what he called an omnibus bill. Douglas told Clay that he feared the bills could not be passed unless handled separately. But he promised Clay, who won that omnibus, he would do everything he could to help pass it. Douglas delivered several lengthy addresses in behalf of Clay's package of bills. In his first speech, he turned his attention to complaints by Senator Calhoun that the South was being deprived of territory in the Mexican session. Douglas denied the premise. The idea that the South, he said on the floor of the Senate, or the North, he argued, was entitled to a share, quote, in any geographical division is unknown to the Constitution. The territories belong to the United States is one people, one nation. Nowhere does the Constitution give the sections north, south, east, or west, Douglas said, a right to them. This, Douglas told his colleagues, was Calhoun's one great fundamental error. He next considered Calhoun's complaints of northern aggression against the south. Calhoun had objected that the north had prevented slavery in Oregon. Douglas how Douglas asked how the North could be responsible for an enactment by the people of Oregon who had voluntarily prohibited slavery by unanimous vote. The North had no hand in it, Douglas said. He warmed to his subject and revealed a stunning evolution in his theory, in his theory of the effect, ineffectiveness of government intervention in dealing with slavery. Federal law had never dictated freedom in any state, he said, not the ordinance of 1787, not the Missouri Compromise, nor kindred legislation. Notwithstanding the Ordinance of 1787, the Missouri Compromise, and those measures, under whatever name, Douglas said, all the new states which have been admitted into the Union with clauses in their constitutions prohibiting slavery became free states by virtue of their own choice and not in obedience to any con congressional dictation. It is a liable upon the character of those people to say that the honest sentiments of their hearts were smothered and their political action upon this question constrained by an act of Congress, end quote. Then this from Douglas, quote, we all look forward with confidence to the time when Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Kentucky, and Missouri, 
and probably North Carolina and Tennessee will adopt a gradual system of emancipation under the operation of which those states must in process of time become free. In the meantime, we have a vast territory stretching from the Mississippi to the Pacific, which is rapidly filling up with a hardy, enterprising and industrious population. He then declared that that territory would produce 17 new states. All of them, Douglas declared, would be free, whether Congress prohibited slavery or not. Quote, the cause of freedom has steadily and firmly advanced, Douglas said, while slavery has receded in the same ratio. Further, the nation's history had demonstrated that given the choice to determine and regulate their own affairs, the people would choose freedom. Epilogue. Henry Clay had worked nearly eight months to pass his package of bills, and he was so effusive in his praise for Douglas for his assistance. But the wheels of Clay's omnibus came off, all of them, on July 11, 1850. An exhausted 75-year-old Henry Clay left the Senate, retired to the beaches of Newport, Rhode Island, on the Atlantic to recover. Within a month, Douglas had engineered the passage in both the Senate and the House of each of the eight bills. By September 20, 1850, President Millard Fillmore had signed into law the Compromise of 1850. Jefferson Davis, no friend of Douglas, and who voted against every measure except the fugitive slave law, said, quote, if any man has a right to be proud of the success of these measures, it is the senator from Illinois, Mr. Douglas, end quote. For Douglas, the matter was finished. The Compromise of 1850 had been accomplished. He believed the country would acquiesce in it, and he now looked to the two great parties to acquiesce themselves to the Compromise of 1850 as the final settlement. Quote, now, Mr. President, I have done with these explanations, and I trust forever. In taking leave of this subject, I wish to state that I have determined never again to make another speech upon the slavery question, and I will now add the hope that the necessity for it will never again exist. Thank you. Thank you, Red. I'm going to bring uh, Dr. Graham Peck on uh, to speak with uh, both Reg about some of the comments he made within his discussion. And we are going to uh, ask some few questions and then hand it over to our audience. Welcome back, Graham. Hey, Reg, thank you very much for uh, that wonderful presentation. Uh, I've got a number of questions, but uh, we'll see what the audience has in store for you. Good. But why don't I start with, with this big one? Uh, you've made pretty clear that you are interested in the conjunction between slavery and national expansion in this book. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty evident in your presentation today as well. And it's also evident in the presentation, and, and I think in the book as well, that you predominantly consider Douglas anti-slavery. You don't specifically say this is a surprising fact in line with your title, but that seems to be the way the analysis trends in the talk and in the book. And of course, there's been plenty of historians who've said that, uh, most notably Robert Johansson argued that, the great Douglas biographer, the greatest scholar ever of Douglas. And Harry Jaffa, who was also a great scholar, still alive, I believe, He's dead. He, I had a slightly different take than Joe Hansen, but uh, it's worth thinking about. He said that popular sovereignty, quoting that same speech you quoted about uh, many states becoming free in the West through popular sovereignty in the Mexican session, that this showed that popular sovereignty was a free soil policy and that, uh, that Douglas really was taking on the position that Southerners feared that he was sort of knifing them in the back by proposing a neutral policy that in fact was going to lead to freedom. Interestingly though, Jaffa ends up concluding in his book that Douglas was a tremendous threat to freedom in the country, one of the greatest threats that the country has ever seen because he was going to run up against Southern intransigence to this outcome, which indeed historically he did. Mm -hmm. and so I wanna ask you, how do you, how do you think about that? Granted, the book only ends in, in 1850, so we haven't yet seen the Southern pressure, you know, emerge to its fullest extent. extent. 
But how do you balance between, if you believe he's free soil, his free soilism and his unionism, which makes him susceptible to their pressure? Yes, very good question. Thank you for that, uh, Graham. I, I would disagree with the opening part of your question, which was that he was that uh, he was anti-slavery. Uh, my belief in reading Douglas is that he was not pro-slavery or anti-slavery. As Abraham Lincoln said some years later, uh, the judge didn't care. And I, my belief is that the judge, based on my first exposition with regard to um, the um, the Whig law um, believed that the Constitution and law stipulated or clearly clearly stated where we should or where he should go with regard to slavery and the Constitution original Constitution had written slavery into three major parts and in eight art or, or eight subsections of the Constitution so Douglas, believe that the founders had created a nation of slavery. Uh, George Washington absolutely agreed with that when Thomas Paine asked him about it, but Washington said it was the best they could do at the time and get a nation. And the fact that they made the constitution amendable provided a way to end it over time. So Doug, I, I kind of disagree with you about Douglas being anti-slavery. I, I believe he was a constitutionalist who didn't care one way or not. I, I believe he cared. I mean, all of us would care about that, but he believed the constitution would provide the framework for it. His personal belief that nobody, no white man and only white men were allowed to vote at the time would vote a constitution with slavery. And he was proven right 16 of the 17 times. Uh, he was wrong with Utah. Utah actually uh, had a constitution that began with slavery and polygamy, which put Douglas over the top on Utah and the Mormon church. But in any case, um, I think he understood that whites, Wilmot was the perfect example of it, uh, would not care at all to have blacks on free soil. That was the purpose of free soil. So if, uh, if let's jump off of that uh, discussion to a related issue. If Douglas was focused on the constitution, as you said in the talk, and he thinks that the Constitution created parameters for slavery. He was not unique in that. As many scholars have recognized, antebellum Americans were immensely concerned with constitutional interpretation. And you spent a lot of time reading the Congressional Globe. You've encountered not just Douglas, but all these other senators and, and representatives sure. also making constitutional argument. And so it's not as if he lays out the constitution and they all agree with him uh, by no means. And in fact, the issue of slavery in the constitution was hotly debated as, as does appear in your book, especially in your analysis of Calhoun. So with anti-slavery folks developing what Jim Oaks has recently called an anti-slavery constitutionalism and people like Calhoun creating a pro-slavery constitutionalism, how do you see Douglas situating his politics in that mix because he doesn't have that that issue to himself everyone's fighting over what the founders had established yeah i i think the answer to that um was where calhoun was talking about how the south was not being protected uh, its institution was not uh, b was not being protected and that the north was uh, attacking the south um, and, and Douglas disagreed with Calhoun. I, I don't think he was nearly quite so um, purposeful in speaking against the other side, you know, the uh, the anti-slavery side. But in terms of Cal, in in the terms of what he talked to Calhoun about, and even Jefferson Davis, uh, among other Southerners, um, he made it very clear that the Constitution that 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 Calhoun was stretching the Constitution, uh, twisting it for his own purposes um, that the Constitution had not outlined as Calhoun did, um, the kinds of support for a section to assure the continuation of its, of its uh, loved institution, um, that it was bound, bound to die. I think the last thing I read where Douglas expected to see the Upper South at some point uh, emancipating slaves um, that didn't happen before the Civil War, obviously, but I, I think his expectation to see that was 
made it clear that uh, the arguments by the South would not hold. And so he believed that the upper South particularly, which wasn't quite as defensive about slavery as the lower South or the, the old South was, um, would, would um, free their slaves and, and the nation would start binding up with that. And it didn't happen. But, but I, think, I think to answer your question, uh, Douglas didn't believe in the constitutionalism that Calhoun was presenting. And I think he made good arguments against it. I mentioned Jefferson Davis too. I think Douglas made it clear to Davis uh, when they had a, a very strong debate in, I believe it was March of 1850. It was while they were trying, while he was working with Clay on the Compromise of 1850, in which um, Davis very heatedly told Douglas that he wasn't doing enough for the South, that the Compromise didn't satisfy the South enough. And Douglas, I think, you know, a compromiser has chits he plays. He don't, he doesn't reveal uh, all of his his thinking or his strategies or the um, the chits that he has to play when he has to compromise. And I believe this was a revelation in some senses that Douglas may not have intended to make, but he did. When attacked by Jefferson Davis, uh, Douglas said to Davis, "If slavery is a blessing, it's your blessing." If it's a curse, it's your curse. On you rests all the responsibility. And Douglas then made the point, his state had tried to, to uh, bring about slavery in 1824 through a referendum. And his, his uh, people, uh, the people of Illinois, uh, voted it down. And he was proud of that. So why is that a revelation? Why what, please? You said that, that he was disclosing something that he normally wouldn't have disclosed. So why is yeah. that a revelation? Well, because he hadn't made it that clear before. Uh, the kinds of things that I said at the end of my speech, where Douglas was clearly uh, saying that slavery would not continue to exist. Uh, states, you know, California and Oregon had proven that when states, um, citizens voted on constitutions, they would not vote for slavery. They would vote free soil. That happened, as he, as, as I said, he saw that in California. Uh, he was going to see it again in, in uh, uh, New Mexico, I believe. And his belief was that, the, the, and his own state of Illinois had denied slavery. His belief was that those proved to him, and, and that was the revelation, that um, he hadn't said that before. And so when he was saying that uh, if slavery is a blessing, it's your blessing. If it's a curse, it's your curse that certainly would have set a Southerner on edge um, for a guy who, who you know, from a, coming from a guy who they thought was at least working sometimes, at, if not most times, in their behalf. Now, so the, interesting the, thing is, the interesting thing is I, I don't agree with you. Yeah. The popular sovereignty had produced freedom. So Don Fehrenbacher, many years ago, argued that effectively popular sovereignty had been a pro-slavery policy because that was the policy in all the Southern territories that weren't organized by the Northwest Ordinance. Congress never legislated slavery into those territories. Southerners just went there with their slaves. They took up residence. They elected legislators. The legislators, as in the states they'd come from, were predominantly slaveholders. And they established pro-slavery laws, copying the laws of the states they'd come from, just like the states in the north predominantly copied laws from the states they came from uh, because it was just a lot easier to take out of a book and copy down the same things and try and write everything from scratch so in fact popular sovereignty had a pro-slavery history and again this was Jaffa's concern in his argument that if there was southern expansion that douglas endorsed which he would do um really both in the 1840s and in the 1850s, that that Southern expansion would permit slavery's legalization through the mechanism, mechanism of popular sovereignty, especially if Douglas was formally neutral, whether he was privately anti-slavery or not, because Jaffa, unlike you, did say he thought that Douglas was privately anti-slavery, but formally neutral, mm -hmm. where you're arguing, I now understand that he was neutral on both fronts. Yes. And, and doctor, I would say I disagree with you on popular sovereignty and slavery. 
because the South states that had slavery um, were actually original states by which in, in, at the time of the declaration, all 13 states, and they were states after the declaration, they called themselves a confederation of states, all 13 states had slavery. There was no popular sovereignty or vote on that. They just had it. Um, as you did say, they, they had slaves, they took their slaves with them, but there was no vote on slavery. Um, after the Constitution, there were still 12 states with slavery, um, and Vermont and uh, Maine, when they were carved off of Massachusetts, got rid of slavery next. So there was no vote on slavery. So the, the, the idea of popular sovereignty favoring slavery, I can't agree with. Um, well, I'm talking about Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, all the Southwest states that Southerners migrated to. At the same time, Northerners were migrating into states like Illinois. And, and, they, and all, they, carried, they all established slave laws. And they carried their slaves with them, sure. Um, one thing I would say about Douglas in that regard, uh, Douglas had the perfect position uh, in committees. I think both, if I believe both were com are created for him, the Senate might not have been, but in the committees on the territories, he had the power. Uh, some historians consider that those committees, the Committee on the Territories in the House and the Senate, uh, probably the most powerful committees in Congress at the time they were doing the work to organize the West. And in that regard, Douglas as chairman of that committee, those committees would have been in, a, in the best position of anybody else really to organize territories with slavery. He had the, the ability to say that. He didn't do that. And so I don't think there's evidence that popular sovereignty, which is what he said would keep, sta keep states free, um, territories were still controlled by government, just so, just so we're clear about that. But states themselves would, no state would, in Douglas's view, um, create a constitution with a slave, create a slave constitution. All right. Well, th thank you for that, Reg. Let's turn to. Ann, are you muted? Are you muted, Ann? Thank you. <laughs> I'm watching everyone else's mute button. I forget mine. Yeah. Um, so as we're waiting for Graham to come back online, um, I would love to uh, open up the conversation to questions that people may have. And we have some that have been collecting for us. And Reg, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I always joked with um, my father, who's a Lincoln scholar, I always joked with him about how um, I was going to study Douglas instead of Lincoln. Um, and for someone who studied Lincoln their whole life, um, it kind of made him step back a little bit. <laughs> um, so we have some questions here. Uh, the first one comes from Emily Lawrence. Why was Douglas so arrogant during um, the campaign trail? Um, so I know, Red, you're going to be um, writing another book. You're in the mm -hmm. midst of the process of finishing up uh, Douglas's uh, later years. Um, and I know you're probably going to end up mentioning this in your book later on. Um, but could you help Emily out and uh, explain a little bit about uh, Douglas's arrogance? Yeah, I, um, I guess you could call it arrogance. He did have the support. He had a lot of support from wealthy individuals, including George McClellan, who ultimately became Lincoln's general. Um, McClellan had been, at a very young age was an engineer and became the head of the Illinois Central Railroad and provided, you know, really fancy, uh, a really fancy car on a train that was dedicated to hauling Stephen Douglas around um, during his campaign. And it's, and that was that was true even with the 1858 debates. He had a better car than, than Lincoln did. Uh, Joseph Gillespie uh, wrote a wonderful story about Lincoln waiting for a train in Mattoon, I believe it was, after the Charleston debate, and uh, <clears throat> to go to go on from Charleston, I believe it was Galesburg was next. But in any case, to go on, and when the train finally got, and and whether it was Douglas or De or, De or uh, Douglas Democrats who caused it, the train didn't get there until after midnight. Everybody was tired. Uh, when Lincoln tried to get on the train, he found the train filled up with Democrats. There were no seats. And so Lincoln asked uh, if asked the conductor 
if he could be if he could go into the uh, one of the coaches i believe it was the mail car so he could get some sleep and the conductor told him no uh, ultimately he got to go there but lincoln had uh, he was highly mistreated and and douglas was very well treated in both campaigns the campaign of 58 and the campaign of 60. whether it was douglas's arrogance i'm certain he was arrogant i I mean, I don't know that many politicians, but the one I, know, the ones I know who've been around a while, um, are are much more uh, uh, confident. Let me say it, put it that way, uh, than people who are just getting started. So, yeah, arrogance may be the good term. Graham, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think I would add that he was by that point one of the leading political figures in the country, and he had been ever since the Compromise of 1850. He. I, I think was the most important senator in the history of the country. I've said that for, for many years. I don't think there's ever been a senator who's overshadowed three consecutive presidents, which I, I believe Douglas actually did during the 1850s. So he, he had been at the center of, of the storm for good and for ill for a long time. And I think that that actually was part of his power at that point. He did not wish to be seen as equal to Lincoln or to other politicians if he could avoid it just in the same way that, I don't know, a leading tennis player gets out in the court with some young guy, doesn't want the other guy feeling he can beat him. And so you want to hold that out. And I, I think that Douglas undoubtedly conducted himself in that way, whether we want to call it arrogance or confidence. I, I certainly think he, that was a tool that he was using by that point in his career. In the um tourism field, we always like to say that Douglas was trying to make up for his step, his height. <laughs> uh, the fact that he was a foot shorter than Lincoln, he had to be more arrogant, and more boisterous because he had to compete with someone who stood out in a crowd. He needed his cannon. Yes. He, he was a better speaker, though. I mean, he had that deep, booming voice and Lincoln had a high pitched shrill of a voice. Uh, that didn't carry across large crowds. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think sometimes with arrogance, you're, you're kind of trying to make up for some type of downfall you may have or that you feel you may have. Um, so we have another question here, uh, and this one's from Bill Furry. Excellent program. Douglas said the federal government did not affirm or prohibit slavery in the states. But didn't the prohibition of slavery in the Northwest Territory lay a firm foundation for an anti-slavery constitution in Illinois and other future Northern states? You want me to take that in? Sure, we'll start with you, Graham. Uh, but sorry, Reg, and then we'll move on to Graham. Okay, and, and thanks to my friend, Bill Furry, for that question. Uh, what, what I would say about that was, Illinois, in fact, tried to come in as a slave state in 1818. They had uh, they had considered, if not had written, uh, a slave constitution. And when the Congress, namely James Talmadge of New York, got wind that Illinois was going to be submitting a slave constitution, Talmadge reminded them of Article 6 in the Northwest Ordinance that slavery was prohibited there. But this is something else we I didn't talk about in my, my uh, speech. But under the equal footing provision of the um, U.S. Constitution, any new state had the right to the same institutions, domestic institutions, of any of the original 13 states. And as Gray and I, and I were talking, all 13 states initially had slavery. So in the, the equal footing provision was meant to make sure states were equal in every provision that any state had. And so Illinois tried to come in as a slave state. And I think Douglas would have said that the Northwest Ordinance really didn't prohibit it because even though they came in as a free state, they were permitted under the equal footing doctrine to try to become a slave state. In Illinois, they tried in 1824, a constitutional convention referendum was held. That referendum defeated the idea of a, of a convention. Uh, I think the ratio was 53 to 47. And so Illinois did not become a slave state, but the Northwest Ordinance didn't prevent it. In fact, it grandfathered something like, if I, if I, if I remember correctly, something like 900 slaves um, in Illinois along French settlements. So it was designed to prevent it, but it didn't. And in fact, Illinois in 1809 was carved off of the territory of Indiana 
the larger territory, because they were so slave oriented, the Indianans wanted the Illinoisans out and they got rid of them in 1809. So uh, that, that indeed was Douglas's position, and Douglas and Lincoln debated that uh, in the later 1850s. Douglas um, had to contend with Lincoln's famous statement, how can you explain uh, you know, the idea that climate influence or climate decides where slavery will go, which is an argument that Douglas ended up articulating, uh, when we can see very clearly that the actual settlement of slavery and freedom has been determined by the law, because we can look over the Ohio River and we can see one side's free and one side isn't. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I will take uh, Lincoln's side here. I think Reg is wrong, and I think Douglas was wrong. In fact, a lot of what Reg stated shows that the Northwest Ordinance was critical. What happened was that a lot of slave-owning Southerners didn't go to Illinois precisely because, during the territorial stage, precisely because they could lose uh, their slaves or be forced to move again. So the entire settlement of the territory was radically different than if the Northwest uh, Ordinance hadn't existed. And in fact, uh, as was documented at the time, a lot of slaveholders were moving through the state uh, and they would go to Missouri. That was not just after Illinois became a free state, but before it as well. And so there was a very different group of people that were voting on uh, on, on the issue prior to statehood. That being said, were there some pro-slavery types in the state? You betcha. In fact, most of the political leaders were slaveholders and there undoubtedly uh, was a movement. We don't know too much about it because we don't have great records of the Constitutional Convention, the, the Illinois' first Constitutional Convention, but clearly there was a big battle over slavery at that Constitutional Convention. And uh, I think there's a very decent likelihood that there would have been a slave state constitution, except for the Northwest Ordinance, which is what Reg just said, that the, that the slaveholding politicians wanted to come in as a state that had enormous value to them, whether free or slave, because you could become a senator. There was spot, you know, two senator spots, representative spot, a governor. There's all sorts of offices that would get created, and they wanted to come in, and so they ended up hedging their bets on that point, and they did not push for a full pro-slavery constitution that delayed them enough years, so that ultimately there was a huge free state migration into the state in the early uh, 1820s that when the vote was taken in 1824 that the free staters won. So I, I really disagree that the Northwest Ordinance didn't matter. I think Bill Furry is correct on this one. Yeah, I, I would just say to that, that the Northwest Ordinance didn't apply to uh, states below the Ohio River. So there was no, no vote there, or no popular sovereignty. In Illinois, there was a vote that was held and popular sovereignty prevailed. I mean, the the uh, the freedom of the state prevailed via prop popular sovereignty. Well, there was popular sovereignty in this way. There there was votes because everyone the, the state legislature had to make a decision in all the other states too, south of the Ohio River. They chose slavery because they could, so they had freedom to choose. Reg, okay. popular sovereignty, as Douglas defined it, was Congress not preempting the decision by either positively establishing slavery or excluding it. And that was in fact the option that the, the Southwestern territories had. Yeah, well, I, di I disagree, but okay. Well, one, one book I think that will kind of help us in the midst of this discussion is uh, Kate Mazur's book, uh, Until Justice Be Done. Um, it was released, uh, I wanna say a few months ago, and it describes the, the different sections of the northern part of the United States in their views on slavery and black laws. Um, while Illinois became um, eventually a free state, the black laws was almost like slavery to a lot of free blacks that were living here. Um, and when I gave tours at the Old State Capitol and at the Lincoln Heritage Museum, uh, there was a really neat map that was created that showcased um, the anti-slavery northern part of Illinois and the southern pro-slavery part of Illinois, where today politics now have flip-flopped a little bit, not saying that Illinois is pro-slavery uh, currently, because we're not, um, but it shows the difference of opinion uh, within the state um, that divided us in half. Um, and so I think for Douglas, it was the perfect playground trying to decide to work within a state that was divided and trying to unite it. Um, but the black laws, uh, as we can see in the historic record, 
um, made it very difficult uh, for blacks here in Illinois, but also um, individuals who had slave in the upper South, when they came through, a lot of them signed their uh, slaves under indentured servitude, which was still allowed in Illinois. Um, so it's, it's a very complicated issue um, because people were able to find loopholes um, within the state. Uh, so it makes this type of discussion um, very interesting because there are so many ways to look at it. Um, but yes, the Northwest Territory was a was a battleground, and uh, it was a, it was the beginning of a snowball effect um, that led to uh, a lot of angry fights within Congress, which leads us to our next question. So uh, Emily Laurent has another question for the two of you. Um, is it true that Douglas was present in the Senate chamber while Sumner was beaten by Brooks and apparently enjoyed the abusive act? The answer is no, but he was in a, he was in a um, room just off of the uh, Senate chamber, did see it occur, and I think he did enjoy it. Sumner had uh, criticized him greatly, called him a slave hound, which he may have been. I don't know. I don't, I haven't seen evidence of that, but uh, he wasn't in the chamber, but he was nearby. All right. Uh, did he have any, uh, I'm going to add to this question. Um, did he have any comments on that act? Because a few congressmen within, um, I want to say it's uh, Professor uh, Joanne Freeman in her book, um, Field of Blood. She ends up discussing this at great length. Um, about the actual uh, altercation on the floor, but then also response from different senators who saw it happen and how they commented on it. Is there a comment from Douglas about this particular um, act within the Senate chamber? Graham, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I don't remember. I have read about that. I haven't read about that recently, and it's you know, decade or fifteen years ago since I've probably read something about that. I, I just don't know. I mean, what was interesting about it was the enormous outrage that it produced in the North, and correspondingly, the enormous support that it produced in the South. So there was a popular response that showed the deep sectional differences. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm echoing. I don't know why. Uh, I don't, I don't hear you as an echo. Oh, good. Maybe it's just me. Perfect. <laughs> um, so I, I do know that um, there are so many questions that we can compile to ask the two of you about Douglas, um, especially since um, he has been of a large discussion within the state of Illinois in regards to our statuary and who gets to have statues and gets to have a legacy and get remembered. Um, <laughs> Reg, in reading both of your books, uh, which I'm very fortunate to have, um, I, I get the sense from your writing that Douglas, he felt like his legacy was very important. It was a kind of a centerpiece of his life. Um, it was very important to him um, about how people viewed him, what he stood for and his character, which we like to look at Lincoln and his character traits because, um, Lincoln is, is easily read, um, but also it helps that he became a icon within um, the annals of history. But with Douglas, he's not really studied as closely. And considering his legacy meant the world to him, um, how do you think Douglas would react based off of the discussion of his life and how it's interpreted? Yeah. Well, it's a good question. I'm not sure I can answer it. I mean, there's a lot of speculation required for that. And um, um, I, I, if he was concerned about legacy, I think it was. I think he was concerned about giving people a sense of values, um, a foundation. You know, when the day he died, his wife Adele Cuts asked him, "Is there anything you want to say to your boys?" And he, he told them essentially love the, uh, you know, obey the constitution and love the law. That was it. There was nothing else. And so um, legacy 
and I'm getting the same feedback, I guess, but legacy for Douglas, I'm not sure was really that important. I mean, um, my books apparently have shown you some something that was subconsciously written because I, I, I didn't write with the purpose of talking about Douglas's legacy. And, and I'm not sure I even thought about it. Uh, in fact, his view of statuaries, I would, you know, would he be aggravated about taking statues and memorials down? Um, there, I would say, I don't think he would. I think he had enough trust and, and confidence and appreciation for individual votes that if, the, if that's what the people wanted, that's what the people should have. Uh, I, I typically inscribe my books, Wilkes well, Populi Wilkes Dei, which was a saying that Douglas used occasionally. I'm not sure how often, but I like it a lot because it says a lot about Douglas. And that is the voice of the people is the voice of God. And that means, you know, that's that's really the essence of popular sovereignty. You know, that, that Graham is a brilliant um, scholar. I'm an amateur at history. Um, each of us has our talents and gifts. When all of the Grahams and Reges votes are compiled, they start, there's a lot of standard deviation, but at the same time, there's an apex where they all come together. And that's the best of democracy because it represents where we come together. We still have standard deviations, but we are together. So I, I don't think Douglas, I mean, my sense would be that Douglas was not that concerned about legacy. He probably thought about it. And as the previous, one of the previous questioners said, um, and as, as Graham, I think, acknowledged, probably an arrogance in Douglas, but I'm not sure he had that much in the way of uh, concern about what his legacy was. He was very popular. He loved social functions. He had parties all the time. He and Adele at, at their house in Washington. Um, when when he was a young man, he said, someone asked him, you know, how, 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 how do you have so much popularity? He said, I eat with my constituents. I drink with them. I go to their churches and I eat their corn dodgers and sometimes even sleep with them. You know, those are not things that I think clothe you in a royal kind of legacy. They're just good, common, uh, compassionate and caring individuals. So I think that uh, the interesting question is, what do we do with the legacy of the past? And the past is, of course, not just Douglas's legacy. It's much bigger than Douglas. And whenever you've got a national legacy, and I, I certainly always interpret Douglas in a national context, I think that's that's why we study him, that's why we study Lincoln predominantly. And whenever you have a national legacy, you're going to have a complex legacy. And that's not just true of this country, it's true of every country. So I, I, I think the interesting question would be if, if our audience has got some questions about legacy, I'd be curious if they did. I haven't seen any at the moment, but no. um, but maybe maybe we'll get some thrown in thrown our way. Well, I'm um, I'm going to be presenting you with some questions uh, in the meantime uh, while we're waiting for more um, from the audience, uh, folks. If you don't submit questions, you're going to be hearing some from me. Uh, and uh, my background social history, and uh, I like to focus a lot on Illinois and. Reg, I'll have a lot of questions for your next book because it involves the debates, which uh, I, I actually enjoy reading the debates because uh, you get to see a little bit of um, fighting words within uh, the context between Lincoln and Douglas. Um, but one of the one of the things I've always found interesting is Lincoln and Douglas were the young up and comers. Uh, Douglas a little bit more so than Lincoln um, here in Illinois. Um, but there's always been this um, this rivalry, but they also had a friendship in a way um, outside of the courtroom and outside of uh, the political arena. Uh, could the two of you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I don't think people realize how they were able to separate um their lives in a, in a way. You get to go first, Graham. All right. Well, okay. I've never been convinced they were all that friendly. So I, I, I have a difficulty answering this particular question. There are 
as is the case with many subjects, there are different opinions on it. And some people do believe they were friends. Uh, I'm not quite so certain. It's, it's, it's unquestionably the case. We don't have enormous amounts of evidence of that, you know, especially not from their own hands. But I would, I would say this. There's no question that there was a degree of respect. Yeah. And there's no question that there was a profound concern for the country, even though, of course, that can pit two nationalists and patriots against each other very sharply if they have different understandings of what the country should be. So I think you see this hardcore divergence between them when they're contesting over the country's future. It was also true once the South seceded, which Douglas was very consistent in saying he would never accept that. He never wavered on that. He wavered on a number of things. He never wavered on that. And he told them in the campaign in 1860, he was the first presidential campaigner. He campaigned down at the South twice, two tours. And he told them, if you secede, I'll throw all of my power to crushing out the rebellion. And he did that. He followed his word. As soon as it happened, he goes to Lincoln and says, tell me how I can help. So that is really how I would frame yeah. their relationship. I think that's on sound ground. Uh, friendship is a little trickier. Um, and it's also possible, by the way, they knew each other for a long time. So relationships with some people can kind of go up and down. And I think we have such scanty evidence on it. That's also a possibility that we just don't know much about. I, I would add to that, that it is hard to tell whether there was a close relation or a close friendship. Um, I've not seen anything that said it was a close friendship, but there was a relationship, I think, built on respect. Um, in 1838, at in the back of Joshua Speed's store, Lincoln, Douglas, and about six other to seven other young men would get together uh, frequently, almost on a nightly basis, and debate. And um, they promised themselves that they wouldn't debate religion or they wouldn't debate politics. But it typically devolved into that. And Douglas one time threw a book at Lincoln and, and said, uh, let's, let's discuss this someplace else. And that's when they set up a series of debates uh, in Springfield. And I think it was at uh, one of the churches. It might have, might have been, the, I don't know, I'm not going to speculate which church. But anyway, there was a series of debates. And um, Douglas arranged the uh, schedule of those debates. And he set himself up to debate first. Uh, the Democrats were first, the Whigs were second. Interestingly, he scheduled Lincoln uh, for his presentation on December 26th. The other debates were well attended. Lincoln's debate was not, and he was not very happy about it. And he actually gave a second uh, second presentation, and it was carried in the uh, in the journal. But I, I would, if if I may, I just we were talking earlier and about Lincoln's Lament, the fragment that was written reputedly in December of 1856. And this would have been even after the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which Lincoln said roused him back into politics. But even after that, Lincoln wrote, 22 years ago, Judge Douglas and I first became acquainted. We were both young men, he a trifle younger than I. Even then we were both ambitious, I perhaps quite as much as he, with me, the race of ambition has been a failure, a flat failure. With him, it's been one of splendid success. His, name's fill, his name fills the nation and is not unknown, even in foreign lands. So there was, a, there was respect on both sides. I know when Lincoln was, was uh, named the only candidate for the Senate race in 1858, Douglas said if he won, it would be hard won. He respected Lincoln greatly. Uh, he envied Lincoln's ability to tell stories he wished he could, um, but he he couldn't. And so he, there was a great respect for Lincoln. Graham, you might know this one. Um, in with the debates, Lincoln, when he found out that he lost, um, he made the comment, um, if I don't laugh, I will cry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I To me, that's one of my favorite responses from him after failing at something uh, because it, he just kept it shows that Lincoln just kept moving it, because if he stopped then his world will just start come crashing down on him so it shows him just trying to get past this 
Um, so I'm looking forward, Reg, to your um, book on uh, the remainder of Douglas's career. Um, one of the things that in preparation for your talk tonight, I did a lot of uh, research on Douglas outside your book uh, to kind of get a better idea of, um, as Graham mentioned earlier, the the ebb and flow of of people's um, character, of their friendships, of their life. And it looks to me after the debates and maybe even a little bit before, things start to take a nosedive for Douglas. Um, and where do you see him recognizing that things are just not going the way that he planned, but by golly, he's gonna keep going um, because it looks like he just never stopped. Um, so where do you see the, the dip starting? Um, we'll start with Reg and then Graham, it'll be interesting to hear what, what you have to say on regards to the, the downfall of Douglas almost. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it downfall because he he never considered it a downfall. But I think the point you're getting at is, um, you know, where where his problems began. I, I consider his compromise of 1850 really his greatest achievement. But uh, in 1857, well, a, a couple of years earlier, his first wife died in ch giving ch giving birth to a, a, a little girl. And that was devastating to him for a bit. Um, and shortly after that, he took a bake or actually took a trip, traveled through Europe. And then when he came back um, in 1857, he had been stripped while he was gone, basically by the South, by men of the South, of his chairmanship of the Committee on the Territories. I haven't read yet, and I, I probably haven't researched enough yet, but I'll look for it, that he was devastated by that. I'm sure he was hurt. But he never, you know, he never um, complained or or lashed out or sought revenge for what was obviously a, a tremendous uh, slap at him. And after that, I think you know he was hard pressed in the debates. Uh, he himself felt he was lucky to win, and it was a win only because of some redistrict redistricting that had occurred, and and gave and provided some votes that he probably wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And um, and so up, up from there till the South went out, uh, I think he was devastated to know, I believe in 1856, the, the South was going out. They made a decision. I've read some books on William Lowndes, uh, Yancey, uh, Robert Butler Rhett, and uh, Edwin Murfin, who were, um, what were they called? Fire eaters, Graham. And uh, they had started planning a secession first from the Democratic Convention of 1860. And that's actually what happened. And then they planned a secession from the United States and ultimately came true. So, you know, Douglas, knowing these people, probably had a sense of what was going on and regretted it. Um, there was no way to stop it. I believe the South was going out come hell or high water. You know, the North population was growing in 1856. John C. Fremont, you know, in a brand new party, less than two years old, uh, a young man who um, hadn't been a politician, but had he won Pennsylvania, which he was not going to do because that was James Buchanan's home state, he was going to he was going to win that state, and Illinois with its ten electoral votes, had Fremont won those two states, the electoral votes of those two states. He would have been the 15th president of the United States. The North was growing. The South saw it very clearly. Uh, Douglas planned for working, uh, plan, actually figured he would have to win in the House of Representatives in 1860. He didn't even make it that far. But I mean, the North was growing. The South was not. And Lincoln wins with less than 40% of the vote without a single vote from the South. So the South was going out. And I think Douglas knew that. It was, uh, I think it highly affected him. So to answer your question, his personal life with his the death of his wife, uh, the loss of his great powerful position in the Senate when he got back from the vacation, and then knowing that his colleagues from the South were, uh, were agitating for secession. Yeah, to add on to that quickly, I think 
you could look at two moments that were particularly important. One moment was, well, not a specific moment, but it was the failure of Kansas to come into the union peacefully through popular sovereignty. If that had happened and it had been a free state, slave state, totally different issue, but it had been a free state, I think there might have been a window to a political resolution of the slavery extension issue. Uh, Lincoln thought that was never going to happen. I happen to agree with Lincoln on that one because the nature of, of how popular sovereignty was established in Kansas was disastrous for the credibility of the doctrine. You know, once you're wiping out the prohibition on slavery from the Missouri Compromise, it raised the ire, to put it very mildly, of the North. And there was a deliberate effort to try to colonize Kansas in order to win, which was actually a logical behavior given what was even said in the Senate floor. People like uh, uh, New York Senator um, William Seward said, hey, we're going to have the competition now. We say we're better. We say freedom's better. We're going to go there and take that land. I mean, he said that and then it happened. It's totally unsurprising what transpired. Um, so that was one problem. When, once, once Kansas was a wreck, it changed, changed national politics. And the other, the other point was the Supreme Court decision, uh, the Dred Scott decision in early 1857, because that actually put Douglas on the back foot from the constitutional argument. You know, Regis pointed out that Douglas was going to try and stick by the Constitution. And I pointed out, well, there were a lot of different ways to interpret the Constitution. What Dred Scott did was pretty much wipe out Douglas's position. And he did end up changing his position because he tried to argue in 1859, he tried to create his own constitutional argument that said Congress you know, really didn't have power over the territories. They sort of had the sovereignty of states. He was only driven to that expedient because of the Dred Scott decision. And what the Dred Scott decision did was completely justify the Southerners that they couldn't have their property rights taken from them in the territories. And it, of course, like Kansas and like the bleeding Sumner, it generated an enormous fear in, in the North. As Lincoln said, that slavery is eventually going to be legalized in the Northern states. The Supreme Court's going to take that decision next. And so it, it created a constitutional log jam. And there already was a constitutional log jam, but it made like a, a massive unsolvable one. And he really couldn't find his way out of that uh, problem. So you see, I think you see him getting fenced in, boxed in as the, as the decade progresses starting in 1854. And his power constantly decreases and the power of the anti-slavery and pro-slavery side constantly augments. They have greater political support um, both among politicians and among the broader public of their sections. His support is decreasing in both areas, though it's never zero in, in either the South or the North. So I have one last question for you, and this comes from Mike Gross. Um, he ended up submitting this in the midst of our conversation. And then I have uh, a final note and we'll be able to- um, well, I think this is a question for you, and this is your favorite subject. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you were just so, asking us if we're going to cover this. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I asked the gentleman before we got started here, I have a huge interest in Mary Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln's relationship, as well as uh, Stephen Douglas's relationship with his two wives and the effect that the women had on the men in their lives. And so Mike is asking the question, was there any truth to the Mary Todd and Douglas courtship? I personally think there is truth to it because Mary was a very motivated person. Um, there is evidence of it uh, within primary source materials um, in oral histories that have been collected by Herndon and Welk. Um, if you take a look in um, Dr. Michael Burlingame's um, Abraham Lincoln a life. Um, there is evidence of Mary seeking out the next president of the United States. Um, and Douglas uh, at the time seemed like a really good gentleman uh, to, uh, to court uh, because he was quite popular. Um, he also was very sociable, which um, really connected with Mary Lincoln or Mary Todd at the time. 
Um, and because she was a social butterfly herself. Uh, the only problem is Douglas was not very decisive in regards to his stance on uh, big button issues. Uh, he wanted the states to make their own decision. Mary Lincoln, there wasn't really a gray area for her. Um, she wasn't a gray area kind of person. Um, and so in looking at <clears throat> her draw to Abraham Lincoln, uh, she could tell that there was some potential. Um, also to kind of put a plug in for um, my, one of my coworkers, Dr. Burlingame, um, Mary felt that Lincoln was more manageable than Douglas was. Douglas was a person who was going to make his own decisions. Lincoln was someone who you could have a conversation with and persuade him to think otherwise. So Mary felt that she had more of a political pull with Mr. Lincoln. Um, that is a personal belief. If I find the magical document, I will be happy to share that <laughs> with everybody. Um, but she was a very, um, she was a woman on a mission and Douglas, uh, she ended up testing out that relationship and didn't really work out for Mr. Douglas, which in some instances, it was probably better for Mr. Douglas because Adele was a pretty amazing <laughs> woman. So later on when he met her, I think that uh, he found his next great match. What do you gentlemen think? I, I would suggest to Mike that uh, Mike Gross, that he read chapter 11 in my book called The Contest for Miss Mary Ann Todd. And I, I don't think there was much of a romantic relationship um, there, there are a couple of interesting things. One was um, Mary Todd was visiting her uncle in Missouri. He was a judge. I think his name was David. And Lincoln, who was attending a Whig convention at Rocheport, made a seven or eight mile jaunt out of his way to visit uh, Mary and then went back to Springfield. Mary had a good friend named Marcy, Mercy Levering, who also visited Springfield. She was the daughter, she was living with a gentleman who was a contractor in Springfield. Their friendship uh, brought about a number of letters. And in one letter, Mary wrote to Mercy, um, a, a man I thought who had long since forgotten had sent me a journal. And, she, and no one, Graham would probably know, but when I saw that, I knew who she was talking about. Uh, the journal was named Old Hickory. And in 1840, that journal was created by Stephen Douglas to tout the presidential candidacy of Martin Van Buren in Illinois. And of course, Lincoln was the chairman of the campaign for William Henry Harrison that year. Well, what, what she did not mention in the letter, what Mary did not mention in the letter to Mercy Levering, was that Lincoln had come to see her while she was visiting her uncle. She talked instead about getting, while she was visiting her, visiting her uncle, getting a copy of Old Hickory, which, which is fascinating to me. It says something that she had at least some interest in Douglas. But the fact was uh, when she was asked, I believe it was by Elizabeth, her sister, who was married to me and Ward Edwards, why not Douglas instead of Lincoln? And she, and she said, uh, Douglas chewed, he cussed, he drank, and he spit, and he spit on the carpet. Mary said he was too profane. So, you know, whether that's the reason or not, I don't know. But the, the other good story was when Lincoln returned from the circuit one year, it was in, uh, let's see, 1840, he returned in September, and he saw Mary, and I believe she did this purposefully to try to win Lincoln's affection. He saw Mary on Douglas's arm. Two days later, he jumps back on his horse, circuit's not you know, the circuit's not being, um, there's there's no law practice on the circuit at that time. And he was gone until November. And um, Rodney Davis has always asked the interesting question, when did they have a chance to get engaged between then and January 1st of 1841, the, uh, the famous fatal first that Lincoln didn't show up for the wedding, you know? So who knows how that happened, but Mary apparently was trying to win, uh, win Lincoln's attention by walking on Douglas, walking with Douglas, her arm in his arm, and driving Lincoln out. So until November, so there were only a, there was only a month and a half or so 
in which to get engaged. But Lincoln, the second time he was engaged to her, also got engaged rather frivolously. So maybe it was a spur of the moment thing. I don't know. But I don't think there was any real close relationship, at least my reading of Douglas, that uh, between Douglas and Mary Todd. Well, James and Mercy Conkling's letters are amazing to read through. It's it's a gossip column of what was going on in the midst of um, Springfield and the high political seasons. Um, and the way they talk about Lincoln and the way they talk about Douglas is it's pretty it's pretty entertaining. So, Graham, what do you think? I will defer entirely to the both of you on this one, and I think we should probably be wrapping this up since we've yes. gone past seven thirty. So, thank you, gentlemen, so much for uh, speaking with us about uh, Stephen Douglas. Uh, one thing I like to ask all panelists and speakers when they come um, and present uh, for the Center for Lincoln Studies is. Um, how, what, what is one thing, one short thing that we can learn from Douglas today? What is something that we can apply from his life and the things that he did um, and what he represented? How can we use that to motivate us today? Yeah, I'll, I'll just start. I'll say, I'll say that um, for Douglas, there was no, there was no sense of revenge. Uh, even, at, you know, Graham pointed out that during, at the beginning of the war, uh, he had just lost an election a few months earlier to Abraham Lincoln, but the war was more important than any kind of relationship beyond that. I think he did have a, a feeling for Lincoln, although I'm not sure it was very close, but as Graham said, when the war broke out, uh, he went to Lincoln and asked what he could do to help. And so even though Lincoln and he had battled uh, two years earlier, and and he quickly learned Lincoln was going to win the election, learned from the August elections of governors and statewide officers in the North that Lincoln would win the election. Douglas turned South, and instead of campaigning for Stephen Douglas, he campaigned for Union. And his last campaign for Union was at the request for Lincoln, where he asked Douglas to come back to uh, try to keep John A. Logan in the state. And Lincoln did one more thing, which in my third book is the finish of the third book that will blow your mind. One more thing that he did that I don't believe anybody has, has I've not read it anywhere. So that'll be your, that'll be your incentive, Graham, to buy my third book. <laughs> All right, Graham. I, I think, you know, I, I've always admired his nationalism, his unionism. Uh, you know, I, I don't get too attached to it because it's a 19th century nationalism. And he wanted to kind of occupy the whole hemisphere if he could. He was not alone in this, but he was certainly one of the greatest expansionists in the history of the country. Um, but, but, but nevertheless, sort of his love of liberty generally, his love of people having opportunity, he didn't extend it as wide as we would extend it now. But in general, sort of his, uh, his idea of the liberated individual having opportunity to develop themselves in the framework of a free country, this I think is still very valuable for us today, even if we redefine some of what a free country means and which individuals we would incorporate into, into that opportunity. Well, thank you both so much uh, for speaking again about uh, the Honorable Stephen Douglas. Um, I encourage all of our listeners and those who will be tuning in um, and looking at the recording to go out and research more about the individuals who are surrounding Abraham Lincoln during this time to gain a better understanding of not just Lincoln, but what our country was going through and what we um, can learn from them to uh, become more civically engaged today um, and know more about our history so then we can live live better in the present and prepare for the future. So thank you again. Thank you, Anne. Thank you too. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just tuned in to a virtual program uh, called The Surprising Stephen A. Douglas, uh, brought to you by the University of Illinois at Springfield Center for Lincoln Studies. Um, we will be joining next time for a panel discussion with the Lincoln Heritage Museum at Lincoln College, uh, July 7th. Uh, we will be discussing their documentary that they've put together called Our Cause is Just. Uh, we will be, dis be discussing 
uh, a brief um, history of the Haas collection at the Lincoln Heritage Museum, the importance of preserving and collecting family letters, uh, but also what message does it leave for us today and how can we connect with students um, on our college campuses to look at this local history and to expand upon it so then they're able to learn for different vocations um, that they will be going into for the future, but also how can history be more involved in our lives? So tune in next time uh, for our panel discussion and many other programs here at the Center for Lincoln Studies at UIS. Thank you.